welcome you all once again. Uh, uh, nice to see so many familiar faces, and it's also nice to see some new faces that are pushing my face. I hope to make in the next few weeks. <coughs> so, so we are studying Lee algebra. So, first question we want to uh, ask ourselves, maybe not too seriously, but nevertheless. So, uh, why why study Lie algebra? So for this, maybe I'll uh, ask you uh, a related question. It may not be clear why it's related, but it will be part of uh, I'm, what I'm going to say in a few minutes, um, that these two questions are related. But maybe you know the answer to this. Why study groups? We all understand group theory is an important subject in mathematics. Just plain abstract groups or groups with further structure, maybe topological groups, maybe Lie groups, maybe algebraic groups. Groups with, uh, on which there is a further structure of some topology or geometry and the group operations are, uh, belong to the category in which is, uh, of, the, of the geometry or the topology. Um, Anyone wants to say why groups? Why study groups? Pardon me? Very good. So it's about symmetries. Uh, so, um, yeah. So, for, of course, we could throw this. It would be very interesting to sort of continue this discussion for a while. Of course, it would be, I would have loved to do it, but um, considerations of time. Uh, mean that we have to go on. So let me also sort of give you an answer to it. Okay, symmetries is correct, but I'll phrase it another way. So it's because automorphisms are groups. So you take any mathematical structure, whatever, what are the symmetries of that mathematical structure or automorphisms of that mathematical structure, and they form a group. Okay, so that sort of, I mean, I hope I'm not, wrong in saying this, you, uh, uh, that that's sort of a philosophical reason for why groups are important. Okay, So why groups? Because automorphisms form groups. Okay, so there is a similar reason why one studies Lie algebras, and I want to um, say that, and I'm leading up to it. So, uh, but let me make some few definitions uh, before I, um, I try to answer that. Okay, so K will be for us a field. V, um, a vector space over K. I'm not assuming right now that V is finite dimensional. I'm not assuming at the moment that K is uh, complex numbers or anything about K, just that it's a field. Okay. Um, so let me ask you, what do you understand by the word algebra? This is just a definition, of course, and you know, you, you could have yours and I could have mine. Um, but generally, what, we, what do we understand by an algebra? Uh, anyone wants to give the definition? So the most general definition is one in which you, it, algebra is just um, using the notation of the tensor product that, that we sort of reviewed in the morning. What, what, so you, V is an algebra. This vector space is an algebra if there is a bilinear product like this, which you call mu the multiplication. Okay? 
this is the most sort of def so you don't exp you don't expect anything out of this uh, mu it need not be associative it need not you know okay so anything further about mu we will specify so this is what we understand by an algebra okay so uh, and what is an algebra so of course once you the modern sort of thing in mathematics is you don't just define objects you define them as morphisms right so morphisms between objects as well so what would be what would be uh, algebra morphisms <coughs> or homomorphisms so i won't write this down but they are linear maps if v is an algebra and w is an algebra it's a linear map v to w which respects the multiplication that is you can write it as a commutative diagram v tends to v to v w tends to w to w and then you have v to w no yeah so using okay maybe i'll so ah that's a v thank you so using the notation you introduced in the morning this is phi tends to phi okay it has that meaning that was defined in that okay so that must be that must commute okay. and phi is a linear map that's all okay and uh, so these are morphisms so we understand what automorphisms of an algebra are right they are self maps which are uh, invertible well strictly speak you should you shouldn't say it that way you should it's such that it has an inverse that's the actual correct way of saying it but then if we know we can easily show that if it's if you have a bijection um and it's uh, respects the algebra structure and it's linear then you can invert it and that's an, we understand what an automorphism is okay so let me um define now the important notion of derivation of an algebra <coughs> or okay before i come to that so for okay so then you can have various kinds of algebras you can have for example associative algebras where this multiplication is associative right you can have lie algebras so i hope uh, in the morning the the definition of this must have been written down right so i won't repeat this so so lie algebra is an example of you know is an is an algebra satisfying further uh, conditions axioms okay okay now what's the derivation of an algebra it's a it's a map from so if v is an algebra you call this a derivation if if it's a linear map and such that okay so some more notation here so depending on which uh, what properties this mu satisfies you use various kinds of notation for this mu okay so for example if in the most general situation you just write this well let you know in the lie algebra case we actually don't do that right we actually write the lie bracket that's more customary this is more customary if uh, if it's associative right but for the moment let me use that notation um okay so um, maybe with a dot just to be a little more circumspect okay so uh, it's customary to use uh, different kinds of notation depending on what axioms your algebra satisfies okay so let us so let me write so now this is a general algebra so i cannot i have to put a dot okay so d dot ab is satisfies the leibniz rule so da dot b 
plus a dot db. Okay. Now the thing to notice is that if you have an algebra structure, the <coughs> Okay, before I even say that, let me come back here. So, what's the um, what's the sort of a standard example of an associative algebra? The sort of pro, uh, meaning, the basic example is is this. Right, endomorphisms of a vector space. Okay, so where the where the multiplication is composition. Okay, that's the st standard example here. And um, we've already talked about automorphisms, and automorphisms form uh, of and of any structure form a group, in particular of an algebra. In this sense, ought ought v is a group. Right, ought v is a group. Now, let me take der v is the, group, uh, the space of derivations of v. Okay. Now, this is unlike the group, this is a linear space. This is, this is a subspace of end v. It's a linear subspace of end v. It's furthermore, it's a Lie subalgebra. Okay, I'll make that more uh, clear what that means. So let us recall. So this is an associative algebra, and you probably, I mean, you probably have already seen, but if if you haven't seen, so let's do it now. Um, Every associative algebra is a Lie algebra in a natural way. Right? You take the commutator product. Okay? So <coughs> this is an associative algebra, therefore a Lie algebra. And so it makes sense to talk about a Lie subalgebra of this. The point is, Derby is not an associative sub. If you multiply two derivations, it need not be a derivation. Okay? But if D1 and D2 are derivations, so is their bracket commutator d1 d2 minus d2 d1 okay so that's so that's a lisa algebra okay so the so here is the so here is what i wanted to automorphisms form groups derivations form d algebras so the answer here is i mean a sort of answer is derivations Okay, so when you think Lie algebras, think derivations. Okay, that's one sort of uh, the first uh, uh, sort of moral I want to convey. Not endomorphisms. No, not endomorphisms, really, but uh, derivations. Okay, so two basic examples of Lie algebras we've given. Uh, well, I mean, when I say basic, so I guess uh, um, Shiva is anticipating me. So I, this is also basic in some way, right? But uh, this is um, somehow to me more, I mean, never mind which is more basic. There is this, there is a associative algebra thought of as a Lie algebra and the uh, endomorphisms of V being sort of God given uh, associative algebra. And there are given an algebra structure, you look at derivations of that algebra structure, they form a Lie algebra. These are the two basic examples of Lie algebras. Okay, so uh, <coughs> uh, 
So let me just uh, mention the notion of a linear Lie algebra. So there are these two basic uh, examples, A and V, and derivations of V, where V is a, this is, when I write NV and talk of it as a Lie algebra, I mean V is any vector space and endomorphisms of V. When I write this, I am assuming that V is a V is an algebra. Okay. Of course, you can make it. You can take uh, uh, the zero multiplication, and that would be good too. But it may be not interesting. Okay, but that would be good too. Okay. In which case, it would be an equality. Okay. So. Um, What's a linear Lie algebra? This is uh, uh, a basic definition, but as you will see, it's sort of, uh, uh, you'll see that it's not really a relevant definition. Um, so, uh, so by definition, this is a subalgebra, a Lie subalgebra. Ah, by the way, I have to mention here, when I think as a Lie algebra, when I think of end V as a Lie algebra than, rather than an associative algebra, I use this notation for it. Okay? So that is just equal to end V as a Lie algebra. So a Lie subalgebra of GLV, and uh, I don't know if this is necessary, but uh, in any case, we'll, for the most part, be uh, doing only this. So I'll assume finite dimensional work. Okay, what's a linear Lie algebra? It's a subalgebra of Lie subalgebra of GLV, where V is finite. So we, under, we know that this is, you can think of these as, if V has dimension some D, then you can think of this as d cross d matrices. Okay? And uh, as always in mathematics, when you make a definition, there is a concrete object. There are things with, that we like to think of them as, as being concrete and things which, are, uh, things which are abstract. Like, for example, when you define a manifold, you can define it as certain, some house door space with some properties and such that you know, it is, there is a patching data given, etc. The concrete thing would be it is some embedded in RN and has some uh, as being embedded in some RN. That would be concrete. So similarly here, there is the abstract notion of a Lie algebra, which is a, a vector space along with a Lie bracket satisfying uh, certain axioms. But on the other hand, that's a more concrete one. So that's our model for a concrete one. So in that sense, Shiva is right. So this is indeed basic also. So, so that's uh, our. So the question then is, so the so you have something abstract, you have something concrete. So, the, how many ways are there to represent an abstract object by the concrete object? Or that's a, that's an interesting thing to do, and that's what we will be studying. Okay. Um, but let me mention a certain basic foundational theorem. We will not do the proof here, neither does uh, Humphreys. But uh, it's a good thing to know. It's due to Addo. It says every finite dimensional Lie algebra is a linear Lie algebra. So really there is no loss of generality in studying, uh, in assuming that your Lie algebras are given to you as uh, subalgebras of matrices. No, 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 yeah, yeah. So far, uh, any characteristic, but I got the proof for finite characteristic. Uh -huh. theorem mainly for characteristic. Yeah, so there is, 
but it is true without any without any assumption. Okay, so let me state it in other words. So in other words, so every finite dimensional Lie algebra admits a faithful finite dimensional representation. So that's using the language of representations. Has somebody defined what a representation is? Yeah. So this is So really, there is no loss of generality if you assume that. This is something to keep in mind. You should, um, that you can always think of it as being embedded in some GLV. Okay? There are, there's no loss of generality in assuming that. Okay, so now uh, more on this. So, Automorphisms are form groups, derivations form Lie algebra. So we said that's the reason for study. I mean, this is sort of an analogy. Just like automorphisms form groups, derivations form Lie algebra. So this is some reason to study Lie algebras. But you might ask, uh, I mean, you might ask, you might not ask the question about this, but you might say, why study derivations in the first place? Right? So automorphisms somehow are symmetries. Right? So that somehow is, we don't ask the question, it seems natural. But why study derivations? So I want to now um, so make it, so we have, the analogy was this way. But there is this way too, there is a relation. And I want to talk about that. Okay? So uh, here is um, how I want to say it. So assume, I want to now assume that V is a finite dimensional algebra. <coughs> and then look at ought V. So ought V is sitting inside GLV by definition. These are linear automorphisms in particular. And this is sitting inside end of V. Right? This is the subgroup of all invertible elements here. Not subgroup, the group of all invertible elements. Okay. okay, so the observation I want to make here, and maybe you can take this as an exercise. First tutorial sheet, first problem. Okay. So I'll write something, and you have to check that. Ought we is a Zariski closed uh, is Zariski closed in GLV. Okay, it's a subgroup clearly. I'm saying it is a Zariski closed subset of GLV and I'll say what that what I mean by Zariski closed. Yes. That is that is so what this means is that is it is the locus of zeros of a set of polynomial functions of a set of, let me just say polynomials. It is the locus in GLV. Of a set of polynomials or polynomial functions. Of course, what do we mean by polynomials? Where are the polynomials? So you, this is a vector space. 
V is a vector space, then the endomorphism of a vector space is also naturally a vector space. So on a vector space, there are naturally, you know, you can talk of polynomial functions. Okay, you can introduce coordinates and then you can write polynomials, but those functions, I mean, the, the, the I mean, if you want, if you want abstractly, they are symmetric algebra on the dual space. That would be the correct way of saying polynomial functions. But if you write coordinates and write a polynomial in those coordinates, such a function is called a polynomial function. Okay? Of course, the, the, the introduction of coordinates is, is not such a, you know, uh, you can do, you should be able to do this without introducing coordinates, in which case you would do it using the symmetric algebra definition. But in, in any case, so, if it is a polynomial in one coordinate, if you change the coordinates, if you change another set of coordinates, then it will be a polynomial, a different polynomial perhaps in those coordinates. But there is a, well, a good notion of what it means to be polynomial function on this, okay? So what are polynomials in GLV? I take functions here that the, uh, when you, restriction of polynomials here, from here to here, I call polynomial functions here. And I am saying that, um, that this is GLV is Zariski open here, but ORT V is Zariski closed in here. Okay? GLV is Zariski open in end V, ORT V is Zariski closed in this. Okay? Yeah. So, um, so the so which of these, which of these linear automorphisms actually, what you have to ask yourself is which linear automorphisms satisfy the multiplication. And if you, if you write that out, you will see that you will get a bunch of uh, equations. These are polynomial equations. And that's, that's the meaning of this, okay? Okay, so you take the automorphism and uh, so that has this property, okay? So when you have some, um, something like this, you can talk about the tangent space. So if you have a, if you have a Zariski closed, if you have some uh, vector space, as we do here, or an open subset of a vector space, open subspace of a vector space, this is open in the sense of, uh, this is Zariski open as he said, which means it is um, just where a certain polynomial, namely the determinant in this case is non-zero, okay? So you, you have um, a Zariski closed subset of, then you can talk about the tangent space. Okay, so the, although you may, I mean, <coughs> uh, you may be unfamiliar with these notions, I understand, but my point is, uh, I hope this, this was uh, reasonable enough, okay? And I want to give you a heuristic of how to compute the tangent space. Okay, this is more like doing calculus. Okay, if, you, if you're given an equation in advanced calculus, if you're given an equation, how would you say x cubed plus y cubed plus z to the five equal to zero? How do you, and given a point on that, um, uh, which satisfies that equation, and you have this surface, how do you find the tangent space to that surface at that point? Okay, there is a, you follow a certain procedure and we will follow the same procedure except in slightly more abstract and uh, notation that sort of carries through no matter wh wh which field you are over, etc. Okay, so <coughs> let's just do this. So I want to do heuristically and here is the second model. This heuristic calculation uh, is something I'll, uh, you will be very, uh, it's a very useful thing and I hope you will, uh, if you are not already familiar with it, that it is one of the things that you will take back from this uh, uh, school as having learned. Okay, so I want to compute, so here is what I want to do.
compute the tangent space to ought v at, at the identity by the following heuristic. Okay, so let's do this. So what do I mean by the identity? I mean the identity V to V taking every element to itself. Okay, that of course respects everything. So it's an element of the automorphism of the algebra V. Okay. <coughs> so let's do this. So I will write <coughs> So uh, some of this might look strange to you if you're if you're seeing it for the first time, but it, it's uh, it's something that uh, you can easily uh, get used to. So 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 write i d plus epsilon x for an element. in the neighborhood hood of identity. So I am taking the identity and sort of disturbing it a little bit, moving it a little bit. Okay? Now I want to write down the condition that this element is an automorphism. So Imagine that your whole space is uh, uh, your V. Inside this automorphism group, automorphism of V is some kind of a closed sub sub closed sub. Okay, and you are at a point on this, and I'm trying to compute the tangent space on that. So identity, and I am disturbing it by epsilon x. So x is something linear. So, I, so the condition that I'll write down is that this x, so, the, so the, what do we want? The, the disturbance should be such that that is along the uh, ought v, right? That's the condition we want to write down. So what I'll do is I'll take this, this is a general element in the neighborhood. We want it to be an automorphism, right? So we write that condition. Let's write that condition. So if I want this to be an automorphism, so write this. So the so for i d plus to be an automorphism or let's be safer if is an iso is an automorphism okay then so let's write it out what does this mean so my algebra is general, so I'll use a dot. Okay. Now let me now let me do the algebra. Now heuristically, if not rigorously, also. So so this is this I'll write as v dot w plus epsilon times x of v dot w. Identity acting on v dot w is v dot w plus epsilon x acting on v dot w is epsilon times x of v dot w. And similarly on the right side I write v plus epsilon x v dot w plus epsilon x w. So let me expand v dot w plus epsilon x v dot w plus epsilon 
v dot xw. I have to keep the order because I don't know if it's commutative. Okay. Now, plus, of course, I have this epsilon x, x square xv dot xw. But here is the heuristic that this is an infinitesimal change, right? I'm maybe talking like as if in a physics course here, but actually this is can this can be made precise. Okay, so, um, so um, this has a um, you know you can just uh, take it to be a, a, you know a ring with k epsilon mod epsilon square or k t mod t square, and epsilon is the image of t in that ring. And so, although what I'm saying seems a little unrigorous, it is perfectly mathematically rigorous. Uh, but let's not worry about it. Let's just be reassured that it is so and happily continue with this pleasant calculation. Okay? So, epsilon square, I'm going to put it equal to 0. So, this term is gone. Okay? So, what do I get? And so, this, this cancels with this. So, this is 0 because higher order. Because of higher order, because it's higher order. Okay, so what do I get? I get v dot. So this cancels, and equating the equating the coefficient coefficient of epsilon, I get x of v dot w is equal to x v dot w plus v dot x w. Which means what about x? X is a derivation. So what have we proved? That the derivations for, uh, is the tangent space to the automorphism group. So the, our original automorphisms, groups are symmetries. Therefore, we are interested in automorphisms. And deriv these derivations of an algebra, if you are, if you are in interested in the automorphism of an, of an algebra, then the derivations of that algebra are nothing but the tangent space to the automorphism group of the algebra at the identity. Okay? So, there is every reason to study derivations. Okay? So, um, okay. so, what we have proved therefore is, <coughs> okay, now let us do <coughs> The converse calculation also. What I want to do is and exponentiate it with the, again within quotes. Okay? And again we'll do it very happily, we'll make you know <laughs> we'll make a, 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 there it's much more much more cleaner. Here at least you might have been um, taken a little out of your comfort zone, but there it is completely within with algebraic and completely rigorous okay so let's do the other calculation so let me b before i do that let me write this so there v is the tangent space at the identity to r3 Ought we is an example of what you call a Lie group or an algebraic group. Okay? And there we is the tangent space to that Lie group, which means it is the Lie algebra. So, if you take a Lie group, or, so allow me to talk for a couple of minutes um, in some using terms which I which not be 100 percent familiar with. So, uh, when you are given a, a group with a manifold structure, uh, with obvious compatibility properties, such a thing is called a Lie group. Sometimes you might ha have even more structure, like this Ott. It is not just a Lie group; it is it, it has an algebra. It's an algebraic variety, so it's an algebraic group. Okay, so uh, um, and then in those cases, you can talk about the tangent space. If you have an algebraic variety a at any point, smooth or not, you can talk about the tangent space. Okay. Here, and this point is smooth, but we don't really care. You know, we can just compute the tangent space in any case using this heuristic. Okay. So, we have computed the tangent space and found that the derivations of the algebra 
are the ta uh, form the tangent space. Okay. Um, so um, in general, if you have a Lie Al Lie group or an algebraic group, the, by an algebraic group I mean a Zariski closed subset of GLV, which is also a group under multiplication or under matrix multiplication, then its tangent space will be a Lie subalgebra of GLV. So see this is an open space here, this is a linear space, right? So what is the tangent space to this, this at any point? It is that linear space itself. In particular at the identity, it is uh, itself. This is an open thing in this. Therefore, the tangent space at the identity to this is the same as the tangent space at the identity to this uh, linear space. And let us, let me call that GLV because that it has extra structure. Okay, so GLV is the tangent space to this. So the tangent space to this would be a subspace of this tangent space, which we have seen is del V. Okay. Now the, the other important point, which I will not talk too much about, but just mention in passing, that see if you so we have what we have done is computed the tangent space at a manifold of a man, at a point at a certain point to a manifold. That's what we've done. Okay. Except that this manifold has further structure, namely it's an algebraic group. Okay. See, normally when you take a manifold and compute the tangent space at some point, you don't expect to recover anything about the manifold from this information. Okay? However, the, if the manifold is also a group, then somehow the tangent space at the identity carries, maybe uh, not intuitive in the beginning, but carries a lot of information of the group. In fact, almost everything about the group. And this was one of the um, um, realizations of uh, Sophus Lee after whom the subject is named. Okay? So that's a remarkable thing. So we can get, so not only is this just the tangent space and this, uh, that gives us a reason to study this, but furthermore, for a, for a good part, ought we itself. Okay? So we can go back to, so that's a remarkable fact. Okay? So in any case, we'll be reassured that this is, it's worth studying this one. Okay? Now let's go to the, I want to do the converse calculation. Now. Namely, I want to, because it's an important calculation to do, take a derivation and try to exponentiate it and show that it gives us a, an automorphism. <coughs> So conversely, let's exponentiate a derivation. So I'll make the following assumptions. V is a finite dimensional algebra. D, I'll assume, is a nil potent derivation for reasons that then exponentiation makes uh, perfect algebraic sense. Okay, I'll also assume that uh, characteristic of k is zero. Okay. So let me now introduce an important notation. So this is d divided power n, which by which I mean <coughs> makes sense. So 
So at n equal to 0, you think of it as 1. Okay. Now here there is a, so is this clear? So this is also a derivation, but I have divided by uh, n factorial and called it the uh, round bracket n. <coughs> okay. So we can write x d happily, right? And we know what this means. This is so that's one advantage of the divided power notation. It's, uh, that looks simple. Okay. <coughs> so is a finite sum. So I don't have to worry about convergence or anything. So it's just a finite sum because I've assumed D is an ill-potent derivation. Okay. So it makes sense. So I want to, so my aim is to show that this is an automorphism of this algebra. Now that's an elementary calculation which I could leave as a homework, but I'll do it because it's an important calculation and the, for example, this notation is very basic and it's important Although it is easy, it is, it's very significant and it simplifies matters a great deal. Okay? Furthermore, you see, it is, you will see in the last week that you may not have, you may not be in this situation. But nevertheless, see, I, I don't see, when I take characteristic k equal to zero, I'm saying n factorial is divisible in k. But n factorial is, but it's enough that this is, this exists in the, you understand what I'm saying? You, maybe you will not be able to divide n factorial by n factorial every, every element, but may, maybe just this derivation dn is probably, if it's divisible by n factorial and this happens to be in your ring, that's good enough to define an exponential. Okay? This, this will become significant when you define Chevalier groups. Okay? But that's uh, getting ahead of ourselves. So let's just now, for now, just check that this indeed is an automorphism of the algebra, okay? And like I said, it's a very pleasant calculation. So <coughs> here is my exercise two. It's just a computation. Uh, can you remind me of what the first exercise was? I was, ah, that uh, Zariski closed, yeah. <coughs> So, uh, uh, B, W, and zero less than K is less than equal. Okay. Again, the notation is, see, it's very clean. All the binomial coefficients are gone. <laughs> okay. So uh, that's that's an easy exercise, so I leave, you can do that by induction, I suppose. So let's compute x d of v dot w. So I'll do this quickly and um, let you digest this slowly back at home. So this is d. So this is by definition. Now I have this summation. And then th that summation there. Okay, but look at this. This is uh, symmetric. I can just change this to. OK? 
Okay. So we've shown that if you exponentiate a derivation, you do get an automorphism. Okay, it's a simple calculation, but a very important one. Okay, so now, okay, now here comes the real exercise. And this is a long one, but uh, you will have occasion to use the result of this exercise almost every day of the school. And that is compute the tangent spaces to the groups So GLV, uh, so V is a finite dimensional vector space. GLV is all automorphisms, linear automorphisms. SLV is all automorphisms which preserve volume of determinant equal to one, okay? SOV or OV, whichever you want, I'll write SOV. So what do we mean by SOV? Uh, v has a um, non-degenerate symmetric uh, not no, not necessarily positive definite. No, we just say non-degenerate. Okay, symmetric non-degenerate form. Okay, um, because our field is, is could be complex. It need not be. Yeah. Okay. So um, so you have a non-degenerate symmetric bilinear form. O is the orthogonal group. That is the group of automorphisms which preserves that form. And SO is further that it also preserves the volume form, okay? Or has determinant one and preserves the form, okay? And similarly, SPV is the group where you have uh, a vector space on which a uh, anti-symmetric non-degenerate form, which means that in particular that the vector space must be even dimensional, okay? <coughs> so using the heuristic, given, I'm asking you to compute these, okay? So in particular, you can compute, so, so uh, compute in particular, compute their dimensions. So you might ask, what, what do I mean by the dimensions? Dimensions of the Lie, uh, Tangent spaces, yes, dimensions of the tangent spaces, but they are also the dimensions of the groups. Okay. Okay. Now, <coughs> when did I start? Four fifteen. Okay. So I have a, have a little more than okay, half an hour. Okay, let's see how how much I want to do this. Okay, so uh, in this way, I want to continue and uh, do a couple more things before I shift gears. So um, so let me make this continue with this sure state and give you a proof that if you have a subgroup of GLV, then the tangent space to the subgroup is a Lie subalgebra of the script GLV. Okay, so let me give you that proof. <coughs> So suppose G is a Zariski closed is Zariski is a Zariski closed subgroup 
of GLV. Once again, I mean one which satisfies some, it's the locus of, in addition to being a subgroup of GLV, it is the locus of uh, a certain set of polynomial functions, locus of zeros of a set of polynomial functions restricted to GLV. Okay. So we want to show that I can compute the tangent space to this in that same heuristic fashion. Okay. That is, I'm going to assume I'm taking an element here, calling it id plus epsilon x, and then I'll write the condition that, that epsilon x must satisfy those that is key closed conditions. Okay, and then I will obtain a x, and also, it's a, okay. So, um, so observe that the group acts on itself by conjugation, g acts on itself by conjugation. So let me write G. So I've just indicated the conjugating action by uh, superscript. Okay, so the identity is a fixed point for this action. See, identity is a fixed point So the group acts on itself and the identity is fixed by the group, okay? So the tangent space, the group therefore acts on the tangent space of the identity. So, Thus, G acts on the tangent space. G to G at the identity. So let's work this out. G. So that is, that's what I get, which means, so here is my element of the tangent space of the identity, okay? So, so I'm saying, uh, uh, that isn't, So the action is given by G, that's the action at the Okay, now write one plus epsilon y for G. G y G inverse equal to one plus epsilon or G. So I'm writing one plus epsilon y for g, and so what will be g inverse? If I have, g, if g is equal to one plus epsilon y, you want to guess what g inverse is? It'll be one minus epsilon y. So I write this, and then expand it, and once again, treat uh, epsilon square as zero. So then what do I get? So, so this is identity. Right? 
I get x plus epsilon yx minus xy plus epsilon square terms. So what I get is that x already belongs to the tangent space. So this also belongs to the tangent space. So I've assumed y belongs to the tangent space and x belongs to the tangent space. Then, then this belongs to the tangent space. So, so this also belongs to the tangent space. Which means that that's a Lie subalgebra. So if I take x to be in G, then y x, y x minus x y or the other way around also belongs to G, which means it's a Lie subalgebra of GLV. Okay, so I see that maybe this was uh, you didn't like this very much, but uh, <laughs> the point is. Uh, that if you take the tangent space, so however you prove this, maybe this proof wasn't to your liking, I admit, you can, but you can do this yourself. The tangent space to the, uh, if you take a 2G will be a linear subspace of this tangent space. And I'm saying the fact that this is a subgroup of GLV will translate to the fact that its tangent space is a Lie subalgebra of the Lie algebra of GLV, which is script GLV. Okay, that's all I'm saying, and that's the heuristic calculation there. Okay. Okay. So let me uh, just one more, five more minutes of this, and go to something else. <coughs> Yes. Yeah. So I have proved that. No, I, what I wanted to prove was that if you take a Zariski closed subgroup, then the tangent space is a Lie subalgebra of the tangent uh, of the Lie algebra, which is the tangent space to GLV. So the reason Zariski closed is in using the see. If it's Zariski closed, only then I can compute the tangent space using this heuristic. Okay, so you only so you you can't do that for a you know how you can't do uh, for an arbitrary subset. You can't talk about it's a tangent space, right? So the the use of Zariski closeness is allows me to talk about a tangent space and compute it using the heuristic. You don't have one plus epsilon something. Where is? Finally, you want to conjure up something that looks like one plus epsilon something. Identity plus epsilon something. I'm sorry, what is happening? X plus epsilon times yx minus xy. Okay, so I am saying that this is this belongs to uh, the tangent space. At the identity. At the identity, yes. Yeah, maybe we can uh, discuss this if, uh, okay, so, um, so, 
see what I am saying is that x is in that x is in g and the disturbance is also along g. See the whole thing x is in g and the uh, and the whole thing is in g which means the disturbance should also be along g. Yeah, it's, a it's a linear space so the disturbance should be along g and that gives you that the yeah. Okay, so a few more minutes of this, uh, like I said. Okay, I want to make an important definition. This is done in Humphreys. Uh, actually, everything that I did say is done in Humphreys. I mean, maybe not in this way, but is done in, in the, it is in the book somewhere or the other hidden. <laughs> okay. So, um, so, next is the notion of inner automorphism. He defines this. So let me make the definition. But he does it only for the Lie algebra. I am doing it for a general algebra. That's the only difference. So once again, V be a finite dimensional K algebra. Over a field of characteristic 0. Um, so the subgroup, the reason for doing this is I want to use x of d. Okay, so the subgroup of what v generated by <coughs> x of d. D is a nilpotent derivation is called is the inner automorphism group. In tweet of so this is the definition okay let us ch check that it is a normal so I am claiming it is a normal subgroup so just like the inner automorphism group is a normal subgroup you know <laughs> The, by, by, if you take a group, what is the inner automorphism group? Conjugation by elements of G. Outer automorphism group could be any automorphism. So the inner automorphisms are uh, a normal subgroup in the outer automorphism group, right? Okay. What is say, phi? Uh, if I take phi is a automorphism, outer automorphism, G is an inner automorphism. Then phi G phi inverse would be inner automorphism by phi g, right? That's the standard. So it's, here it is similar. So it is a normal subgroup of ought v. So that follows because g x d g inverse is x of g d g inverse. Okay, let me try to say something here, although I'm not sure if I'll get this right. So, you have uh, okay. So, so l l let me let G be a. Once again, Zariski closed in GLV. 
Okay? Now, you can think of all G itself. Right? That's an auto. And you can embed or you can have a map from G to RG, namely inner, inner automorphisms. Okay? Now, the interesting thing here is so this is, see, this is a Gazarisky closed subgroup of GLV, but this is something I don't have immediate answer to where it is, where it is, where it lives, what further structure it has. But there is one nice thing. See, uh, there is a map from here. Every automorphism group fixes the identity element. Therefore, there is an action on the tangent space. And so I'll get an automorphism of that. Yeah? And this is a group which, we, you know, this is, this has the structure that we have been studying. This is a finite dimensional, now a finite dimensional algebra and automorphisms of that is a Zariski closed thing. Okay? Now, what do we know? So there is, we know that that is uh, the tangent space there. This is the tangent space here. And what is that map? This map is, uh, I don't know if this has been introduced, but this is add. Ah, but yeah, yeah. So that is the add representation. So G acts on itself by So it's a normal subgroup of now if uh, V is a Lie algebra, then G acts on itself by derivation. Uh, I'm not making great sense there. I mean, what I'm saying is correct, but uh, what is the, one second, I'm, let me try to say what, what, what I meant by that statement there. No, yeah, but I wanted to say it uh, even more. Okay, at the moment, it's slipping my mind. I'll, I'll make it clearer, uh, if not tomorrow, then in the notes. Okay, there is a, a, something I wanted to say about this picture, but uh, the right words are uh, eluding me at this point. Ah, so let me give you a few more exercises. Uh, so I lost count of the number four, maybe. Did I get that right? So this is an easy one, but again, an important one. The set of all inner derivations of a Lie algebra. So I, do you understand by what this means? The image of, so the, the image of G inside this is called the set of inner derivations. The set of all, see just like inner automorphisms form a normal subgroup, the natural thing is inner derivations form a, an ideal. Yeah. 
of a Lie algebra form an ideal. This is an, uh, you know, this is a trivial exercise, but but nevertheless important. In fact, if I take d and then take add of x, what should this be? Add of dx, right? right? That's what else. If, that's the only way you can combine to make sense. Okay. Okay. Now here is. Uh, yeah. Okay, so here, so x goes to add x, and add x is maps g to g. It takes y to x y. Okay, so two, uh, oh no, that's it's five. Recall Jordan decomposition. So that is if you're given uh, endomorphism of a vector space, then it can be written, call it T or something. T can be written uniquely as S plus N, such that, what are the properties of S and N? They commute. S is semi-simple, and N is nilpotent, right? So it is uniquely writable as uh, S plus N, such that S and N commute, S is semi-simple, and N is nilpotent, okay? Now here is something much more interesting. This is not so easy. It's a theorem in Humphreys, but it, I would, it's a good thing for you to try to prove yourself, okay? So, uh, so this is maybe not entirely routine, but interesting if you want to do it this way. So you take, you take a derivation, okay? It's an endomorphism. You, I mean, I'm taking a finite dimensional algebra. Take a derivation. It's in particular an endomorphism. You can take the Jordan decomposition of it the semi-simple and nilpotent parts, okay? Claim is they are derivations. So it's closed undertaking Jordan decomposition. Derivations are closed undertaking Jordan decomposition. What you will see, and this is an important theorem in the subject that we are studying, is that if you have a semi-simple Lie algebra, mind you, you, you must, the semi-simple condition is necessary then uh, whatever that means. I understand that you have not seen the definition yet, but that is the subject that we're going to study. Um, so if you have a semi-simple Lie algebra, then the, you can talk about the semi-simple and nilpotent parts of any element of that algebra. And those will be, again, further elements of that algebra, of that Lie algebra, okay? This is called the Jordan decomposition in semi-simple Lie algebras. This is a very important theorem, okay? Um, and it is being driven, in, in proving that theorem, you will need this fact. And this is the basic fact, among others, that underlies that uh, preserve, uh, you know, Jordan decomposition in semi-simple Lie algebras. That is, the semi-simple and nilpotent parts of a derivation are themselves derivations, of parts of a deriv are themselves derivations. Okay. So, uh, D, a derivation of a finite dimensional K algebra B show the semi simple and nil, nil potent parts of D are also derivations. So And if you, you want me to give a little bit of a hint, 
It's proved in the book. So you could just look at the book. Uh, but I'll say generalized eigenspace. Consider, so that's the hint. It's, it's very pleasant and easy calculation once you see what you want to do, what, you, what to do, but it's not so easy to see what to do. OK, so, so much for, OK, we are close to, we have still five minutes, OK. So I, you, we've had a long day, but nevertheless, I want to continue on to the next topic, which is the other topic that's uh, in my first two lectures is the representation theory of SL2C. This is the no. other topic. So I want to start on that. So, so from now on, let's assume that we are working over the complex numbers, although you can just assume that the field is algebraically closed and characteristic zero. And in fact, I hope to hand out some notes. And the notes, uh, in the notes, I don't make, I mean, I worry about the assumptions in every particular statement. But for the lectures, I will make it, for the sake of sim <coughs> simplicity, let's just assume that we are working over complex numbers. OK? So you probably have no already what this Lie algebra is, OK? So, uh, and you probably also know the reason for the notation. So SL2C would mean take two cross two matrices of uh, determinant one. That's a Lie group or an algebra group. And this is the, the Lie algebra of that. That is the tangent space at the identity to that Lie group, OK? But anyway, this has a very simple definition. It is trace 0, 2 cross 2 matrices. OK? So OK, and again, let me introduce the, the famous elements in this. So this is standard notation. So I'm going to write a basis for this Lie algebra, OK? And that x, h, and y are, it's, a, it's one thing, pleasant uh, notation that remains. Uh, maybe sometimes people write e, h, f, but this is even more common and fixed. OK, now I, what I want to claim, OK, let's write down, what, so the multiplication, it's a Lie algebra, but with respect to this basis, we can write down the, what are called the structure constants, right? So let us write down the uh, multiplication. So hx is 2x, hy is minus 2y. So h with x and h with y I've written. H, with h of course, is 0. And it's uh, anti-symmetric. So the only other thing I need to write down is x with y. OK? And OK? So these are the, this is how the multiplication turns out to be. And this is the basic example of a semi-simple algebra. Now, I understand you, you haven't yet seen the definition of a semi-simple algebra, but this is even better. We did. We, you did already. OK, good. But it's even, so prove so exercise number uh, seven. Oh, but this is exercise set two, uh, number one. OK? Prove that SL2C is simple. OK? So uh, what is the definition you know of semi-simple? It has no solvable ideals or abelian ideals. Here it is uh, even better. It has no non-zero ideals. OK? Uh, non-zero pro, I mean proper ideas. Okay, so this is even a um, 
And there are no, if you have, of course, a one-dimensional Lie algebra, then of course it's trivial because, okay? And two-dimensional uh, algebras are also, they're not very interesting. Uh, this is the first, the, the simplest uh, one, which is uh, semi-simple, okay? So this is the simplest object of our interest, example, okay? And, um, so we want to talk about its representation theory. Uh, so and uh, only finite dimensional, although you can talk about its infinite dimensional representation theory, but we'll talk about only its finite dimensional representation theory. So let me end with uh, um, the main statements of this finite dimensional representation theory, the st st statements I want to make. So one is that these are every, I'll write complete reducibility. That is every representation can be written as a sum of irreducible representations, okay? Um, now, um, uniqueness of decomposition. So if you, say that's another thing that we want, right? If you write it, you, everything is written as a sum of irreducibles, but we want further that, you know, ideally the way you write and the way I write should not be, there should be some, uh, uh, should not be independent. I mean, it, there should be some relation, okay? So uh, the, the, the usual way, the, you, if, you, if you take something and write it, write two different decompositions, then up, after you permute, then they are isomorphic, okay? Uh, by the way, this is not, I mean, that's a general statement about semi-simple uh, categories. So uh, this is not, but uh, I mentioned it because so the next question is, since every representation is a sum of irreducibles, so what are the irreducibles? How many are there? And what is, furthermore, what is the structure? Okay, so uh, I'll end with just uh, those statements, just two more minutes. So, um, uh, irreducibles, finite dimensional irreducibles are parameterized by the non-negative integers. So for zero, one, two, three, etc., there's one irreducible for every non-negative integer, okay? And finally, something about, so let's say n corresponds to Vn. Let's denote the corresponding irreducible by V sub n, then the dimension of that as a complex vector space will be n plus one. In particular, they are pairwise <coughs> distinct, okay? So uh, we will prove uh, these statements. And what you should look forward to is that this theorem is true in general for semi-simple Lie algebras. That's an important theorem which we will state but not maybe prove, just give an idea of proof. This again is a very important theorem that you, will, you should look forward to in the course. There is a certain discrete kind of set which will parameterize the irreducibles of any semi-simple Lie algebra, okay? Furthermore, given an element of that parameterizing set, which, which is usually denoted lambda in general, so this is V sub lambda, 
Okay? Uh, why not be bold and write lambda here and v lambda? Let's remove this and write v sub lambda equals lambda plus 1. So then the structure of v lambda itself, for example, what, it's, what is its dimension? Furthermore, what is its character, whatever that means? So those are the main theorems of the subject. Okay? So for example, the dimension of v lambda, there is a formula for it called the Weyl dimension formula. And there is a character for it called the Weyl character formula. These are the important theorems of this uh, subject, and uh, which I hope we will learn about in the, which can look forward to learning about in the next uh, two weeks. Thank you. Sorry for going over time.